worship from God. Good to see everybody on such a beautiful day. We had nothing better to do than wind up in a place like this. <laughs> it speaks to the, the times we live in. Don't I think today we'll continue our discussion from last week, which you know, those of you who have been coming on Sunday, that we are exploring the seven fundamental principles and tasks that challenge those of us who have decided for what reasons, whatever reasons, to pursue a spiritual life. And my ambition is that uh, if possible to try to speak a little about each of these tasks and what they challenge us to achieve on a personal level. As you all know that an ounce of practice is worth more than a ton of theory. So there's not much that can be achieved in terms of preparing oneself to live a spiritual life through a simple intellectual um, approach to the subject. A goal, of course, that's important, but you cannot realistically expect any kind of transformation so long as your journey you're seeking remains at a level of intellect. It has to move deeper into one's being than one's head. That's what we talked about some of the things that you would need to consider, first of all. Uh, what we call the preliminary contemplations that one has to conduct to examine in order to arrive at one's own conviction and commitment on the path. We spoke about the fact that you can't travel the path because a brother or a friend or a spouse or someone you know and respect is on the path. You have to bring to the path your own personal commitment and conviction. Uh, it is not a group phenomenon. It is not a social event. So one has to find a way to arrive at one's own individual level of conviction and commitment. Without conviction and commitment, you can't move one inch on a spiritual path. Indeed, without conviction and commitment, you can't move on any path in life, no matter what that may be. So whatever we do, we are challenged to do it out of a certain level of conviction and commitment if, in fact, we are truly uh, desirous of some success in that arena. It's no different on the spiritual path. So these mystics and sages and roshis and rebis and lamas or whatever you want to call them, these men and women who uh, since time immemorial have shared with us the insights and the methodologies that they have adapted to and adopted in order to make the spiritual progress that we respect them for have left us with a set of, if you will, mental exercises. And last week we talked about what those mental exercises were and I hope that some of you took times out of your busy schedules to do them. The purpose of those exercises is that when done correctly, they will turn the mind toward God. When properly executed and sincerely executed, it will create in you a conviction and a commitment that is your own. We talked about the fact that one of the exercises that you would have to do is to take a very close look at this whole business about suffering to examine it in what we call Dukkha, and to be able to see with your own eyes the fact that this all worldly actions and all the ambitions and goals that are associated with those actions always, without exception, end in suffering. No exception. And one has to see this noble truth as Buddha called it. Buddha called these things that we talked about last week, these four fundamental subjects and topics that we must take under serious consideration. Buddha called them the four noble truths. These are truths that will liberate you 
These are truths that will set you free. These are the truths that you have to contemplate in order to turn this mind of ours that is so immersed in the worldly uh, arena towards Dharma, towards spirituality. And the first of the noble truth is the truth about the uh, inevitability of suffering in terms of the outcome of all of your worldly ambitions. And you have to have spent some time examining that truth. Because after all, you want to see, are these men and these women, these enlightened beings as we call them, are they telling us something that is valid or is it just so much poetry and philosophy? And remember, all of them, with no exception, have stressed the same fact. So the first set of mental philosophical exercises there, centered around your contemplating this first noble truth, the truth of the absolute inevitability of suffering as the outcome of all your worldly ambitions and all of your worldly activities. The marriages that you thought would rescue you permanently from suffering did not do that. The job that you thought would alleviate you beyond the reach of suffering did not do that. And you need to look at everything that you've done honestly and see if you can say that this produced that unshakable state of happiness that I was in search of when I decided to pursue that course of action. And if you are honest, you will have to admit that the outcome of that course of action did not result in any kind of stable state of happiness. Yes, for a moment you had a flickering of relief, but this is like what the mystic said Nula Nathranden uh, used to do. Nula Nathranden is a, as you know, a mytho mythological character that you find permeates a lot of the philosophies that you read in Islam, in Sufis in particular. And Mula uh, could be seen every day coming home limping, very badly. And he would limp and he would be uh, screaming in pain as he limped. And, and people asked him, they said, Mula, what is the problem? And Mula said, oh, this shoe on my right feet is too tight. It is so tight and every time I step, the pain is just unbearable. And they would say to Mula, say, oh, Mula, the shoe is too tight. Well, what are you wearing? It just you know, why don't you just get the right size shoe and, and, and dispense with all this pain? And Buddha said, no, 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 I can't do that because the only relief I get in life is when I take the shoe off. So <laughs> the shoe is very important. Many of us are like Mula Nafranda. We cling to all of our miserable situations because these situations, when we can step out of them briefly, are the only thing that give us a kind of artificial experience of relief. It is a very negative approach, you see. So when we examine our lives very closely, and we have to examine our, the, our lives and the contents of our life to see if, in fact, this noble truth is indeed true. Is it the case that all of your worldly ambitions and all of your worldly strivings and all of the ambitions and goals associated with that have simply resulted in the perpetuation and the continuation of sin? And when the mind understands this, parts of it turns now toward the path. We talked about the second global truth. We talked about the immense value of the opportunity to be a human being. We talked about how precious this opportunity is. When we consider the fact that the categories of being have taken all kinds of bodies in this creation. There's so many beings who are trapped in the bodies of plants and so many beings that are encased in the bodies of animals and so forth and so on. And for us to be beings who have the opportunity to be in this human body is an immense phenomenon. It is rare, even on a mathematical scale. And if you are fortunate enough to have a precious human birth, I distinguish human birth from precious human birth. Even within the category of having a human birth, there are certain human births that are more precious than others. 
And what is it that makes one human birth more precious than the next? That human birth in which you come in contact with the teachings. That human birth where you are endowed with an intellect and a mind that is healthy enough to understand the teachings. And that birth when you have the physical health and the association of other people for, that you could practice the teachings. In that birth, something can happen. It is that birth that is precious. So many human beings have this body, but they don't have any contact with the teachings. They're not born in a country where the teachings are still alive and throbbing. Perhaps they are not born in a country where there is a master or a guru or a lama that can assist them in their efforts to follow the teachings. That human birth is not as valuable as this precious human birth where we have come in contact through book or crook with these great set of teachings that have existed since time in the world. And to waste this precious human birth is a sin that not even <coughs> God will be here. Kabir Saab says that when a, once the ripened fruit has fallen from the branch, you cannot reattach it. Once you have lost this precious human birth, then again you fall into Sharasa, and then again you fall into the wheel of transmigration. And again now, you must struggle all the way back up to this point of being a human being. And how many eons will go by before that happens again? No one can tell. You see, perhaps from the very first day of creation, you have been traveling through all of these lower forms of life to finally now in this birth to have arrived at the level of the human being and a precious level where you have heard the teachings and to waste that, to take that for granted, you see, is a tragedy to say the least. And so by contemplating the immense value of the opportunity to be a precious human being, that examination, that contemplation will turn the mind. We talked about the third noble truth, the impermanence of the opportunity of being a precious human being because death is such you don't know. Any minute now, your bubble, your bubble can burst. Who knows? And to simply waste time, you see, on things that, as we've already seen, will not outcome in the form of happiness. It's madness. So one has to contemplate his or her own uh, mortality. One has to contemplate how very fragile this opportunity of being a human being really is. And in that realization, the mind will turn toward God and so forth and so on. We talked uh, finally about karma, the fourth noble truth, that there are consequences for every action that you do. And you have to have a certain kind of karma to make spiritual progress. If your life is full of the negative consequences of negative actions that you've done, it will not result in the requisite good karma that constitute the foundation for spiritual growth. If your karma is too bad, as a result of your own actions, then again, it will be difficult to make any kind of spiritual progress. It will be very difficult to take advantage of this precious human birth that you've been given because you have created a karma, you see, that will keep you so scattered, so distracted, that will cause you to experience so much pain, so much suffering, that your mind would not be calm enough to walk this way. And so the mystics say that we need to look very closely at the kind of karma that we're putting out there because you will reap what you sow with no exception. And so they talk to us about the strategies for improving the quality of our karma so that our karma is such that it'll afford us an opportunity to practice the teachings. We talked a little bit about some of the 
negative karma that is guaranteed to prohibit you from taking advantage of this human birth. One of being killed in all shapes, forms, fashion, etc. Uh, we talked about stealing. We talked about the fact of lying. Uh, we talked about the use of drugs, alcohol, and any kind of substance that alters the mind. And of course, we talked about the indiscriminate uh, use of the energy that constitutes sex in itself. So these were the, some of the things that we talked about last time. Today, we're going to continue to, to review those uh, uh, subjects. We're also going to talk a little bit about Seva, because the mystics say if these things, these five things, this line, this this abuse and abuse of drugs and alcohol, this sexual promiscuousness and so forth and so on. These things uh, are the things that we need to avoid in order to create good karma. They also give us a positive approach toward the creation of good karma, and that is called seva. After all, the whole purpose of making spiritual progress is to make a contribution to mankind. We in the West, of course, have a very different concept. We think that one gets on a spiritual path in order to achieve liberation for themselves personally. Normally, individuals who come to the path and never evolve beyond this selfish ambition seldom make any spiritual progress because they are useless. Of what use is your enlightenment going to be to anybody? when you don't even have any motive to be of any use to anybody. Why should God confer upon you this greatest experience called God realization? For what? For you to simply aggrandize yourself in it? It's not about that. This experience of enlightenment, salvation, or whatever you want to call it, is reserved for those who are willing to share the experience. To, out of that awareness, out of that enlightenment, make a contribution to mankind. Think about it. Had these men and women, these Buddhas, these Sajjobas, these Mirabas, these Mohammed, had they not made a contribution out of their own spiritual attainment, then where would the world be today? We'll be far more uncivilized, far more brutal, far more savage. It has only been because of the contribution of these Jesus and these Buddhas that we enjoy a level of civility that we witness today. And so seva means a conscious, deliberate use of whatever <coughs> talents, abilities, and gifts that we have been able to rediscover and develop for the purposes of benefiting another human being. And so we will talk a little bit about Seva today and the role that it also plays in equipping us to be able to, to do this thing called spirituality. Before we do that, however, I want to review any homework. I know you were hoping I would have forgotten, huh? <laughs> but last time I was here, I asked uh, if there would be some brave souls who would venture out and do the homework. Because without homework, nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. And I'm interested to see what were the outcome of your reflections, your meditations on these meditations. What were some of the conclusions that you came to, some of the things you saw. And if you would be kind enough to share that with uh, the rest of us. So, with no further ado, is there anyone out there that did any homework, or did you simply stay on the safe side and just dine the body when you went down the stairs? I have a question. <coughs> yes, sir. Could you uh, explain Dharma? Yes, yes, yes. Dharma is a very complicated word. It means many things. One thing, of course, Dharma stands for the teachings, that the strategies, the technology, the techniques, that enable us to discover what we called our Swabhava last time, our own intrinsic essence. Do you remember, Andrew, we talked about the fact that God has put something absolutely unique in you 
And you got to get all right with that. You see, you got to you got to accept the facticity of that statement, and you can't be poo pooing with that. You have got to understand that there is something in you not less beautiful than what was in the Buddha. There is something in you that is in no shape, form, or fashion any less significant than that which was in a Jesus. And it's in you. And we have called that Swababa. We have called that that intrinsic essence. We have called that that spark of divinity that is uniquely incarnated in you. And that it is in no other human being on the planet. It has never been any other human being on the planet in the history of the world. And it will never be in, in, in any other human being in the future. It is unique to you. And that God has put this in you. And it is like a seed. And the whole task then is for you to discover what that is, nurture that, develop that, and let it flow out into your life to benefit us. It is God's gift to us that he has put in you. And when you fail to develop that, you cheat us. And that's not right. And now for this, there will be great suffering. Suffering, in fact, is punishment for failure to develop this gift. Dharma, then, is the methodology, the teachings that enable us to discover and then develop what this unique thing is in each and every one of us that God has placed for the benefit of mankind. So Dharma is a very collective term. Sometimes when we say that you're in your Dharma, mean that you're on pace, you're doing those things, you're uh, exploring those avenues that is leading you closer and closer to the discovery of this immense thing in you. So, Dharma is a very uh, uh, large term. Yes, sister? So, it's being on purpose. Yes, yes, Dharma also means the purpose of life. It is finding the purpose for which you've been created. It is the actions that you go through to discover your purpose. For most of us, we don't know for what reason we've been put here at all. And our whole life then is just a aimless wandering through time and space with no concept of why we were here, where did I come from, for what reason, what is it that I have to do in this world. We don't know. And we fritter away this precious opportunity to be a human being. And the penalty is that until you discover your Dharma and until you are again reconnected with this inner beauty in you. Until that event takes place, you will simply be miserable. Nothing that you do will be satisfying. You will attain no salvation at all. And the only little pleasure you will get is when you take that shoe off, like Mula uh, Nasta. Hmm? You see? And that is the, the consequences. So it's a heavy penalty when one feels to discover one's swabhava and practice that dharma that leads to the development and the sharing of that gift with the balance of mankind. So it is a very, very uh, serious thing. And you have to contemplate that. Or do you think that you don't have any value? Do you think you just put here that you are a burden on people? That now you're just alone, isolated? That nobody loves you, nobody cares, nothing about you? that your, your life is meaningless, you're not important, you're not significant. So that is a hell to live in. That is a miserable state to be in. Yes, Lieutenant Rashid. You know, it kind of makes you feel like when I was watching Johnny Cochran this week, and when you look at people like Johnny Cochran and Michael Jordan and Denzel Washington, you know, like the brothers said, you make it feel like, what do I have to offer? You know, I don't have that silver tongue. I can't shoot basketball like Michael Jordan. And that, that's what makes you realize you got to discover your dharma because you do feel inadequate. You do feel, you do feel like you got shortcomings because you see all these people in the media and you say, why can't I be like that? Absolutely. And that is a bad fit. That is what we call when we went through the workshop self-contempt. You feel worthless. You feel useless. Even though you have all that potential, but to not know that, you simply remain on a, a, a useless and worthless level. But aren't we uh, measuring ourselves by, you know, the, the, the wrong thing?
things when we try to compare ourselves with a Michael Jordan or um, Johnny Conklin. I mean, society to me is is not the way. I mean, to look at that and think that I'm inadequate because of that. Mm. Well, you That's see, sister, everything that you sense. know is based on contrasting comparison because you're trapped in your mind. You see, even for you to say that I'm a good person necessitate that you look at designate somebody that is bad. You see, so these are just games that the mind plays. The reality you see is that we are all a victim to that. We have no other way to feel ourselves because we don't know who we are. Now yes, those who know who they are, now that's a different matter. Those who have discovered their Swababa have a very different experience because they know that everybody is unique. There's nothing special about any of us, or rather, all of us are special. But unless you have experience and know your swabhava, you see, then we, we are doing the same thing. Just in a different way, just subtly. But nevertheless, you have no option. Because you are fundamentally ignorant. Fundamentally. You don't know who you are. And there are 21,000 afflictions that will assail the mind of a person who don't know who they are. This is interesting. This is deep. The Adhidharma of the Buddha, that whole teaching, Buddha, you know, provided those who were fortunate enough to live in his lifetime with 80, 84,000 techniques. And 21,000 of those techniques were aimed for curing the emotional and mental afflictions that ignorance me. Do you realize how many emotional and psychological problems you are having simply because you are ignorant of who you are? I mean, it's, it's profound. So the whole Adi Dharma, that whole set of literature, exists simply to give us antidotes for curing the mental and emotional afflictions that arise out of and one of these afflictions, we're just talking about one, Russian. We're talking about the affliction of feelings of worthlessness. That's just one out of 21,000. It gives you a, a different perspective on this. Yes, sister. Yes, I did that. You did the homework. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in my observing myself, um, what I found, I actually started looking at things that were going on in my life now. And, uh, and I did a check and balance, and I said, yeah. I thought when I had my baby that things would, would mellow out and things would get better and I would feel a lot more purposeful and what you were saying just a minute ago. I've, I've always, for as long as I live and, and have wanted to direct my life, I've always felt anxious uh, without direction, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And the decisions that I made were always made, um, oftentimes made, not just independent of what I wanted for myself, oftentimes I would look to others in making that decision. And with, with my daughter, she was not planned, but when she was here, I thought it would be better. Yes. Uh, I looked at relationships, I, I, I looked at my relationship I'm in now, relationships that I was in the past, and in comparing them, the same thing. Um, misery. Um, uh, a relationship is not going to answer all those needs, all those spiritual needs that you have inside. And I look at career. I look at my job and and uh, as I <coughs> examine the jobs that I've had in the past, um, I, I, I feel that I made some contributions, but still the bottom line, some of the things that I was looking for to find peace in, to sink in, and to feel good about myself in, it just didn't deliver. It hasn't delivered in the past, and it hasn't delivered now. I looked at everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, none of them have added up. When I look at the job I'm doing now, I'm teaching. I teach adults. And uh, I ask myself, wow, oh, is this it? Is this my small father? Is this my daughter? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I said, no, I don't really think so. I, I, uh, I don't feel any bliss mm -hmm. <laughs> in doing it. It feels like effort. Yes. <laughs> so I, so, so yeah, you know it's, it's, like, it's, it's not like, dharma. Yeah. It's not dharma. But then I remember what you said last week. 
And he said, it's not a goal, it's attitude. But even with the attitude, I feel like it's such effort. And it's all, yeah, it's, I still haven't found it. And I, I ended up wondering, what have I done in my past mm. to bring myself to this point? And then I started getting really, really depressed. Mm. <laughs> because I started thinking, I said, my God, how many people truly are in their dharma? And I started thinking about the movie stars, too. And they seem like they're so happy. And I find myself drawn to watching programs with these rich people. And they're saying how happy they are. And I'm saying, God, are they really happy? Or are they just saying that they're really happy? Is anybody really happy? Who truly has found their dharma? And I just really, and Dorothy and I were talking a little bit about it on the way here. Uh, this, you know, it's, um, it's a bit upsetting. Very <laughs> rare is the individual who has found it. Even these people that look like they found it. We would have seen OJ the day before, he thought OJ was had it. We didn't have it. Irrespective of the money, the fame, and all these other things. In fact, the reality is that these people sometimes are the ones who suffer the most. Because they and they 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 all their deception that they were able to practice on themselves that motivated them to make all those sacrifices to obtain that collapse. And they discovered, my God, I'm famous and I'm rich and I'm miserable. And they're sitting there cracking their brains out on drugs, you see. Because it was empty. And the realization that, my God, my life is still empty after attaining all of this. Now that's a real depression. I've made a million dollars. I am world famous and my life is empty. And their mind cannot even think of anything else to attain. They obtained everything. Mm -hmm. And still this emptiness has not gone nowhere. And then spam very often for them, the only alternative was suicide. Because there's nowhere to go from there. At least for the poor, struggling person, we could go on deceiving ourselves into thinking, oh, if I just get a million, or if I get this, or I find the right person, or I get the right job, and we sort of are able to live somehow off of this kind of self-deception. But a time comes when these self-deceptions collapse, either in midlife or when you actually attain the thing that you thought would now wipe out this experience of you. And very often, when that attaining of that goal occurs, then the dukkha remains. This is more than the little mind. You know what really bothered me most, and Dorothy and I were talking about one right here, is um, a little bit of what you said earlier, is coming, I don't want to come to the conclusion about my life, but, mm. but just the feeling that with all that's going on in my life, that in this lifetime, I might not even attain it. Absolutely. That really, This really is something that you me. have to understand. I might not get it. You mm -hmm. may have already wasted mm -hmm. the major portion of this precious bird, and you may not get it. But that means that you've got something now. You've got an insight. Because once one has really reflected deeply on the noble truth, this is the first thing that happened to you kind of panic sets in. Mm -hmm. You no, see? Oh yeah. And unless this panic has set in, you have not done enough contemplation. When the contemplation has been done right, when you have reached a certain degree of understanding, when you have really begun to fully realize the immense value of this opportunity to be a human being, when you have reflected on the kind of karma that you put out there, when you have looked at all these things, and you look at this bubble that you call life, how fragile it is, and for the first time an urgency comes in. This is important. This is success. You've done the homework correct. A panic sets in. Now, there's nothing else to do. Now, I must tell you this because this is the truth. When uh, it happened to me when I was 19, now at 19 I was messed up because I had had the great good fortune of coming in contact with the teachings of Dharma understood enough of them to understand the value of initiation, you see? And my whole fear was, I'm over here in Lundell, they're killing people like crazy, who knows? Because, you know, at that time I was dating my wife, she lived in the project, I have to go up there, I'm courting this woman, right? 
and I may not never come down. All these fears was there that I may die like this. I wasn't so much afraid of death as such, but that I don't want to die like this. I didn't get anything out of this human birth. Didn't want to die like that. And I went into real panic. I couldn't sleep. You understand? Not like this. Anyone else experienced this? Or is it just me and Pam? <laughs> you experienced? What was your experience? What I left out of here was the idea that I'm going to die. It was shocking. Like you said, very shocking. You know, and I compared it to like if you go to the hospital and the doctor said, well, you know, you got two days to live. What would you do? I would be frantic to see everybody I love. And, and the problems of the world wouldn't be no problem for me now. You know, uh, I'm not getting raised at work, and I wonder if I'm teaching this, but all that would fall to the wayside, you see. I wouldn't have no time to wonder about that, worry about that. Only, I'll be concerned only with love now. You know, and of course, I don't want to die like that, you know, without attaining something. So, frankly, I just, it changed my whole perspective of life. You see, the people I interact with, my, my children, you know, just things in general which is changing, you know, and not worrying about situations, it's, you know, because when you have that idea, when you know you're going to die, all that falls to the side, the arguments, you know, uh, even anger, you know, you don't, if you understand what anger do to you, you know, if you're trying to sit down and do some solid now, you don't have time for that, see, because you're trying to get this. You know, before them two days, so when I left out of here, man, I was scared. I'm gonna tell you, because I know that I should be getting something, and I ain't wasted 13 of my years just aimlessly. See, I'm. Everybody have a different experience. In my experience, you know, it's different than you all. You know, everybody had their own experience. But for me, see, I know better. You know, and I know what I'm supposed to be getting out of life. And for a long time, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll get it two, three years from now, or maybe uh, I'll set some time to the side and do this, you know, because it had to be done, you know. But Bob went shook me up, and he just threw me around the room, you know, and I was scared when I left out of here. I, I rushed to go see my kids, you know, and my parents, you know, so it changed my whole outlook on life. You know, things I wear about, you know, just fell to the wayside, you know. My interaction with people changed. I became a more loving person. You see, it changed. You know, uh, I'm thinking about other things besides myself. You know, so that that was the greatest thing that I got out of it. And you know, my study and uh, observation of myself was, you know, I became a better person, more understanding. I had more tolerance, patience. So in the idea of the death, it, it, it sticks with me now. You know, like sometimes you forget about it, you know, and don't think you're going to die. Now it sticks with me. You see, every minute. I, start, I try to stay aware that I can walk out of here and die. Instantly. You see, so I'm trying to get something out of life, not knowing when life going in itself. See. And I don't want to leave empty hands. And this is what the mystics say you've got. You've been given this precious opportunity of being a human being. And what have you done? Go ahead. The only body in which there's an opportunity to have the authentic experience of this, no other body, no other form of life affords the being the opportunity to have this experience except in this human Tigers, Leopards, insects, frogs, fishes, birds, there is no possibility for them to have the experience of this. That is only possible in this body, this human body. And you've had it now, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And what have you got? And you're not going to have it forever. You don't know when the opportunity. So you're right, man. You see, that urgency sets in when you, you have contemplated the impermanence of life. When you have reflected on this noble thing, it turns the mind toward heaven. 
Now the mind says, I got to get something. So this is the purpose of the reflections, you see? Now you have your own convictions. Now you got your own commitment. Now you have your own insights, you see? But unless one does those kinds of reflection, then you have to do that reflection. You have to do that kind of reflection. You have to put in that energy into it. Otherwise, nothing happens. Now, you see, there's so many people that come close to the teachings of Dharma. Some just come out of curiosity. Now, they're not interested in any kind of transformation at all. It's just curiosity. Oh, we'll see what these mystics are talking about, what they got to say. I get a little information, etc. Now, that's the person that enters the path only on the level of curiosity. They have not suffered enough. Their misery is not great enough. You see? They still think that, oh, if I do this or I get that, they got a whole big list of things that they still are working on. And they're still figuring, well, if I get this house and I get this car and I get this job, I get this woman or I get this or get that, then I'm going to transcend this state of misery that I am. Then I didn't know they're miserable. Yes, they try to hide it. Yes, they put on those smiles, you see. They faking it out, they lie. But deep down inside, they are miserable, you see. It's written all over their faces, in their body language. But they'll try to pretend, you see. But they have this list, you see, that they're still working on. So for them, it's just curiosity, you know. I'll go see what a Jesus is saying, okay, but you know. That's nice, but, you know, I'm trying to get that million. So those are curiosity seekers. They, they derive no benefit. So, Pokemon, do you mm. actually come, well, I don't, in my case, you, you have to go through that look like, in yes. order, you know what I'm saying? Yes. In order to see that, in the long run, it wasn't a big deal anyway. Yes. You have to go through all of that marriage, boyfriend, uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get to this point and, and be like this so-called Jesus because you think you're going to miss out on life. Yes. So you got to go through all that just to see that in the long run, it wasn't nothing in the first place. So by that time, you may be 20, 30, 40, you know, yes. whatever. Yes. You know, so. Yes, you're absolutely right, you see. <laughs> Those are stages that you can't leapfrog over. And you, you're absolutely right. Unless, you know, because it's not promised for you to come back in this so-called human form, right? Yes, yes. Unless you come back in it and you done picked up from where you left off Yes, at. yes. You yes. know, so. Yes, you're absolutely right. These are stages that we all have to travel through. Some have traveled through it in the previous birth. So when they come into this life, they're not messing around at all. Mm -hmm. They come in focused. They come in very clear. You see? They bring those, what we call some scholars, Lord, we talked last time or a week or so ago about mm -hmm. some scholars. They bring in those dispositions. Mm -hmm. And from the time they are children, their only interest is in spiritual matters. You know, they're not interested in baseballs and toys and things of that nature. You know, they don't even get caught up in the Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy phenomenon. They come into this birth focused because they come in off of a previous birth where they have had that knowledge. Some souls, however, have not had it. And they come into this creation, and they have to go through that experience. The teachings are not for them. The teachings are for those souls who have, either in this life or in a previous life, really had enough of this stuff. You well, see? then it's really not wasted time. No, it's no wasted time. There's no wasted time there's in the universe. There's a point to it. Of course there's a point to it. Mm. Of course there's a point to it. Everything and everyone will have to go through this experience. The only problem is that when we say time, we're not talking about wasted time in the sense that all oh, two or three years were spent in learning this and therefore, you know, that's not so bad. No, we're talking about 20 million lifetimes now you'll have to wait to get your opportunity. <coughs> There's no guarantee you're going to get this done. Because why? You look at all this karma you created. Now, you've been holding back, practicing great discipline to keep from killing people. Because you want to kill somebody. <laughs> you see? Really? Now, nature has to give you a body where you can kill. Right? Until you exhaust that desire to kill. You like just killing, tearing stuff up. All right, we have to give you the body of a lion or a tiger or something. 
and that you tear up for five or six or ten or fifteen lifetimes until you exhaust this urge for violence. You see? So you have to understand this thing called karma. You see? It's, you can't erase it. Whatever you did out of that state of ignorance, you have to undergo the consequences of it. You remember I said last time that these negative perverted states of mind, these five perversions as the mystic call it, this anger, lust, greed, attachment, the ego, and etc. And what is so chromatically damaging about being in one of those states of mind is that it shuts down your intelligence, it shuts down rationality, it destroys wisdom. And now out of this unwise state you commit actions. Now you get drunk. Now out of this drunken stupor you act. Hmm? That act is not flowing from your intelligence because your intelligence is submerged under the effect of the alcohol or the drugs. And so the quality of your action, however, will produce a return. So now in this drunken stupor, you go out and you beat your kids up, right? But you were drunk. And when you come back, you sober, oh, you realize, oh, I shouldn't have did that. But now it's too late. You created the karma. And you will have to undergo the consequence of it. You see, out of that deranged state of mind, you have created an action that has caused another human being much suffering. And you don't have to suffer. Can you predict the consequences? It's, it's almost common sense. It's very clear. In the Old Testaments, in the Torah, the Jews, Moses made it very clear. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what you're going to get. The law of karma is exact. And what's worse is that it may not, you may have created so much of that stuff, you can't pay it all off in a single birth. You have to incarnate again because it's so much. But you will get that kind of incarnation, you see, what this law of karma can put itself out. As Jesus said, you will reap what you sow. There is nobody that will escape that. Probably, when you're meditating, don't you burn off some of that karma? When you are able to meditate and go beyond the mind, for the first time, you transcend karma. But it doesn't mean, Pam, that the, the, the consequences don't come. It simply means the consequences don't affect you. Remember, it is the mind that experiences the karma. Karma experienced with the mind. And let's say, for instance, if I have put out that kind of karma that requires one day for somebody to break my leg or something, because I've broken legs, right? If I have practiced meditation, if I've been fortunate enough to hear the teachings, to contemplate these noble truths, and my mind has turned now toward the path, and I have acted on that. I've gotten the initiation, and I've become aware of the technology and the techniques now to transcend this karma. And I have practiced that, and I've made progress, and I've achieved a level of transcendence. What it, that really simply means is that now my leg is still going to get broken because the law of karma is not going to change, but it will not have any negative impact on me. You see? What Maharaj used to say is that it reduces a sword. As if you're being cut by a sword, it feels like a pinprick. It don't hurt you. No now, you've been insulting people all your life. Now, you're going to have to get insulted. Back. You've been hurting people feeling. Now, you, people are going to hurt you back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But when you've been able to transcend karma, now when they insult you, it has no impact on you doesn't hurt anymore. It's a pinnacle. It's gone. And you don't react out of it. Normally what we do, someone makes you angry, right? Or someone gets angry at you, you get red, angry right back at them, right? And you put some more of that negative stuff out. And that's true too, because I went through that a uh, couple of weeks You've been angry? <laughs> and who? I was insulting, would you believe? You insulted somebody? Yeah, very much so, really. And, and even when I did it, I, I was aware of my actions. You were aware of it. I just didn't cease. I didn't stop. I wanted to do it. I wanted control. to get it. I was out of control. I was insane. Temporary insane. And, and I leaped out and I did it. And afterwards, I made myself have no remorse feeling whatsoever. You refreshed like, everything. You know. 
he deserved it. <laughs> then um, <laughs> days later, someone leaped out on me and got me back. Now the same person who I had attacked, mm -hmm. I decided that I wanted to discuss it with that person. Do you know so and so so and so did this to me? Mm -hmm. And you know, and as nice as he is, he said, Well, Sam, what did you think about it? I said, Well, it was no better for me. I'm only reaping what I sow because mm -hmm. I lashed out on you. Mm -hmm. And I'm only I'm only giving back what I did to you. Yeah. And now I know how I made how you know how I made him feel. Yes. And so I deserve nothing but that back because yes. of what I had did to him. Yes. And it was just, it was so odd. I couldn't get mad, but it made me think. I said, why did it to you? Right. You know, and, and he was even there to say, well, how did you feel? You know, real, even supported, even after what I done did to him. Yes. You know, and yes. he's like, you know, and I'm like, well, I read what I saw. I deserved it. I did it to you. Now I know how you feel. Yes. And I shouldn't have did it. So it was yes. wrong all the way across yes. the board. And, but you got an insight. And it increases Absolutely. your awareness. Yeah. And that awareness now will change your behavior. Because yeah. now you're aware that mm -hmm. nobody escapes. You don't want to do it. You don't, you don't even want to do it no more. Yeah, That's the do beauty. No when you do the homework and you have the insight, you don't want to do this now no more. Mm -hmm. It's not because you're, you're trying to be holier than thou. No. Mm -hmm. It's practical. Yeah. It becomes very practical. You're not trying to be saintly. You're being practical now. Mm -hmm. But the consequence isn't always that instantaneous. Yes. Not always, no. but very often. But you know when it comes. You know you when it know. comes. You know it, yeah, you know. Yes. Absolutely, you yes. remember instantly. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You know where that's coming from. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I put it out there. Mm -hmm. You put it out there. So these now become some of the things that you're able to see in your life. And that is the whole point. That is the whole point, is to go on increasing your self-awareness, to go on understanding this stuff deeper and deeper and deeper. And out of that understanding, you will transform. When understanding is, is, is adequate, there's no effort in transforming yourself at all. You see, it's not that fight anymore. It's a natural kind of thing. Enlightenment is natural. It is natural. In the East, they call it Sahaj. It's easy, but natural. When the understanding is and this understanding comes as a result of our reflecting on the teachings. In fact, that's the first thing that has to happen, you see. The mechanics of enlightenment are such that the first step is the hearing of the teachings, the doctrine, and the understanding of it. And there's a number of ways you can approach this, too, fundamentally. One is that you can now study a vast amount of information on the subject of enlightenment. You are to study all of the, the books, holy books. You are to study all of the various religious paths. You are to study deep, very deep, all of the sutras, all of the Vedas, the Quran, the Bible, the Gods. You know? You are to study all mystics, all of the saints. Go deep. And when you've exhausted that, then you have to study the physics, the soft sciences, everything. You have to become immensely knowledgeable. It requires a fast intellectual study. That's one way. Because then you'll understand it. The other way that the mystic has said, or you can go to a guru, or you find a lama, or you find a teacher who have done all of that. Right? And from that teaching, you are able to pluck the essence of the body of literature on the subject, you see? They use a metaphor that beautifully describes uh, this, this thing. And they said, uh, like a swan, mm -hmm. mythologically speaking, a swan who can separate milk from water. You see, if you pour milk into water, it makes it so clear. But this special kind of swans, hunters, are able to dip into the the, uh, uh, the, the the substance and only extract the milk and leave the water there. You see? So they said that when we go to a guru, we're like that swan. We go to the guru and we get the essence. It spares us that arduous effort mm -hmm. that may take a whole lifetime. I mean, there's so many religions on the planet. And who knows what's just like? 
Most of us, our religion, we're born into it. We're not putting any thought into it. My mama was a Baptist, I'm a Baptist. Or my parents were Catholic, I am Catholic. Or my parents is Muslim, I am Muslim. But we have not chosen. You understand? We've just followed in lockstep. We've not thought about it. We've not examined it. We've not gone deep into Jesus if, that, if we are Christians. Hmm? We've not explored his teaching deep. We've not gone beyond... You know, the whatever the preacher said, that is what we've accepted. And we just run with that. But we've not brought our own examination of the immense teachings of Jesus. We were just born in it. Mama, daddy was Christian, I'm a Christian. But you're not a Christian because you've not made any search. You've not sought. Your Christianity is superficial. It is phony. It is made of the same stuff that mythology is made out of it. It's not yours. You don't, you've done no work for it. You've not read the Bible. You said what they say in the Bible, and you accept. <laughs> you understand? Or the same is the case for the Muslim. Now, he's not read Quran. He's not studied the surahs. He's not done his salat. He's not brought his life in alignment with the teachings of Quran. My dad was a Muslim, so I'm a Muslim or Catholic, or Protestant, and so forth and so on. But the master said, no, you go and you search, because you got to find the right one. You see? Like your relationships, you see? You found that person that you love. You know, you went and looked for that. You have to seek that. There is some seeking on your side. Any religion that you are in that is not the result of a long search, Will, you will derive no benefit from it whatsoever. Because you've not sought it. It is of no value to you. You don't appreciate it because you've not sought it. You've done no seeking. And how can you find unless you seek? There is no other way. You must seek. So the mystics say go through this long seeking yourself. Yeah, it may take you a whole lifetime now. Of course, you're gambling, Atisha says. A teacher who brought the teachings to Tibet, a teacher said it may take you your whole life, you see. Or go find a llama, or go find a bull, and take the milk from the water. Saves you a lot of time. Either route you can take, but you must get some understanding of the teachings, that's for sure. That is the one thing that there is no exception of. Now you either get derive a deep understanding of the teachings by studying with a teacher, a lama, or a guru, or a master, or you can go and make the direct inquiry yourself, but you cannot escape the teachings. And of course, once one does that, then one got to contemplate. The stuff you're reading, now you got to sit back. You got to kick back. You got to think about it. You got to absorb this. You got to chew it up in your mouth. You got to swallow this stuff. You just can't read it and then close the book. This ain't no novel, right? You're not reading novels. This is life teachings. You got to think about this. You got to see, how does this apply to my life? Normally when you read, you're pointing out other people. Oh, this is just like so-and-so, so-and-so. No. Reading like that is useless. <laughs> you're trying to see, how does this reflect a truth about me? How is this truth reflected in my life? Is this true for me? You see. You got to meditate on it. You got to contemplate on it. You got to understand it. You got to understand it. Understanding is a different thing than the mere absorbing of information. Very different thing. Understanding can only come when you, 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 you're chewing this stuff. You swallow it. And then when that understanding becomes adequate, you see, then you practice. And it is the practice of the teachings that gives you everything. Just knowing the teachings of Jesus is meaningless. It's of no value whatsoever. Understanding the teachings is good, but more important than understanding is doing it, living it. But how are you going to live it? Because you have no commitment. You have no conviction. You're not thought about it. It doesn't turn the mind toward the path. Because you have not done anything, you, you've not committed to anything. 
You don't have no conviction. You see my point? So these things have to be understood. That is the whole purpose, you know, of those books in the first place. Otherwise, why write them? You know, just to put some on your mind, give you something to think about, to reflect on, and see if this is true. See. Yes. Keep the mind scan. I mean, once you realize the role of suffering, misery, does that, when you make that turn, the mind makes that turn, does that end the mind scattering? Because I can't see how anyone can find their dharma um, with all that going on, not having any control of the mind, not, uh, not being able to, to get on a course. What happens, sister, when you really truly understand fully the fact that all worldly activity and its goals and ambitions associated to them always ends in misery and suffering. For the first time, you become detached. You put no more expectations on anything. You go through life, you do things, yes, but you're not expecting happiness to be returned. You're very detached now, you see, because you know that no have you know, you, you're acting out of a different set of motives, you see, but you don't expect it. And most of that suffering that we experience is because we have so many expectations attached, isn't it? We were expecting certain outcomes and they didn't happen. Now this hurts, now we're depressed, now we're suffering. But all expectations drop. Again, they say that there's 21,000 afflictions that uh, impacts the mind simply because we carry desires. That causes the mind scattering. Oh yes, it scatters the mind entirely. Because the mind is doing what all the time? It's trying to solve your problems of misery. The mind is a problem solving mechanism. It is constantly trying to solve the problems of your misery. That's all the mind does. So Dharma is like a piece of mind. Yes. Yes, when you come into Dhamma for the first time, that whole problem solving thing, because you're trying to solve something that is unsolvable. Right? So you drop that whole thing. And now you surrender to that. You see, it's a very different thing. Now you surrender. Now you excel. Now you flow with life. Now you're in Dhamma. Now you live in the will of God. You're no longer trying to tell God what to do. Oh, God, don't do this. God, don't do that. God, give me this. God, you know what I mean? That's enough to worry you to death, trying to tell God what to do. You see, now your, your life is different. You know, thy will be done on earth. Whatever you will. If you want me to be sick, fine. I'm a, I'll be sick. Okay, I accept. If you want me to be broke, okay, I accept. If you make me a king, that's fine too. But whatever the will, the maj, the hook, whatever your will is, I will accept. Mm -hmm. And that relief, that creates peace in the mind. Mm -hmm. But when you're fighting against uh, reality, you're going to lose every time. How are you going to construct a flow of reality that is, that, that is problem free? You can't do that. You can't even construct a life where there won't be ups and downs and crises and disappointments. That, that's impossible. But that's what the mind tries to do. It tries to remove all obstacles from life, and, and, and you can't. You simply accept them. And just as when you're able to transcend the mind and transcend karma, now these things don't have that effect on you no more. You see? It doesn't affect you no more. You see? And that gives you peace of mind. Yes, brother? Everything that you just say has uh, the essence of the serenity. Uh, yes. yes. And accept the things that I cannot change. Yes. Give me the strength to change those things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, and the, the other mm -hmm. stuff to accept. That's exactly <laughs> it. That one teaching is enough. That's why it's so interesting that you will find in any kind of recovery program, exactly. the serenity prayer is mandatory that you understand exactly. that, because that is really what helps you recover. Exactly. Right. Really, technically. I mean, the, the rest of the steps right. are just a you know, repetition right. of that first step. It is to surrender and to accept your will. That's right. Surrender your will. Yes. And that God's will be done. That God's will be done. Absolutely. And it's such a profound thing. 
And it really works. It really works. So there's a lot of things, and I'm happy to see that, that you all have done some reflecting on these matters. This is a good sign. And that, you know, as you reflect a little bit more, that hopefully it will begin to turn the mind toward Dharma. That we really begin to turn the mind toward this whole um, quest that we are on for spiritual attainment. We have a tremendous opportunity to do this. I mean, it's really something. We are so lucky, each and every one of us. We have this beautiful human body, this precious human birth. We have heard teachings. You know, we're living in an age where something of the wisdom of the Muhammad and the Jesus and the Buddhas are still in the atmosphere. It's such a tremendous thing. You see? If you have the courage, you see, courage is required. Courage is required. Yes, sister? I have a question. Yes. Um, you know, I felt real good. You know, everything's going smooth. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my uh, teenager just Explode. then went crazy. <laughs> How many had um, that experience? <laughs> 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 You know, I, I, I thought the anger was under control. Yes, you know, yes. I'm at work and I can let people be what they want to be. But in my own house, mm. it was like, wait a minute. And, and um, the individual just, he tells me, he says, I need freedom. I'm like, oh, God, what is this? <laughs> I said, am I, am, am, am I being a, um, what am I being? You know, am I being for real? Because I can't allow that freedom. You know, I, I, at 16, I just can't allow you to have the freedom that you feel yeah. that is necessary for you to get along with me. So it's like everything that I had felt so good about, I felt kind of shattered. You know, I'm yeah. like, oh, God, you know, I thought I had to stay together. And here it is, in, in, um, right here, you know, 10 feet away from me. Yes, yes. And he's causing me uh, a headache. So, um, I brought my mom with me because, uh, you, you bring I, help, right? well, you know what, <laughs> I, I told her I had to, I had to be somewhere today and she had to be somewhere, I said, you just got to go with me. She said, well, where are we going? I said, well, you find out when you get there, you know, so, um, but I thought about it and I said, now this freedom thing, because that's the same thing yes. I had mentioned myself. Yes. And I'm like, at 16, what the heck do you know about freedom? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I thought about it. I said, you know, the problem. And he told me, he said, so, you know, I called Dad on the phone. I'm like, it's time for you yeah, to step yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I, I got to get rid of you. You know, you, you can't live with me, so you see if they got room in their house, because uh, I, I ain't going to deal with it. So uh, his dad said, well, just leave him here. So I, and I thought about it. And I said, now, the boy, he's not selling drugs. and not doing all the things that I could just immediately say, well, you got to go. Yes. He's just showing. Uh, independence that I'm not accustomed to. This is my, 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 this is my baby, you know, I've taken care of you forever, even now. So, this morning, I mean, like, it's tears, everybody in the house is upset, because, uh, you know, he want to be independent. So, this morning, I thought about it, and I said, now, uh, and he told me last night, he said, I don't have a problem. <laughs> he said, you, <laughs> you, you got, got the problem. problem. <laughs> and I thought about it this morning. I said, I have a problem because the same thing that I'm trying to attain. Yes. At 16, he wants it. Yes. And he's aware. Uh, I said, well, you want to go to the military? He says, well, you're already a PO. I said, what's a PO? He's a parole officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, I don't need them because they're going to be worse than you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I said, well, the boy kind of knows what what he's talking about. <laughs> so I said, okay, when he comes home, I have to just, I got to realize that at 16, I was working, I was doing this, I was doing that, but he's not doing those things. But his mind is probably on another level than mine was at 16. Mm -hmm. So I got to back off the attachment, you know, yes. but I, yesterday I felt like you know, I read this book, I had a money, you know. <laughs> I couldn't read anything, I couldn't do anything. And I'm like, all of these months, and this one person and just shattered all my, oh man, you know, I'm getting enlightenment, and I'm feeling real good, you know, like almost meditating constantly. You when there's nothing to Yeah, but it just came out of nowhere. And, and I thought about, uh, and well, one thing I did 
was able to grab hold of because mm. what, what I'm doing, I know it's real. Mm -hmm. So even though it shattered for a second, mm. anger came, yes. but it didn't stay. Yes. And I tried to do what I could to solve a problem outside of my normal, you know, because I could have said, well, ain't no problem. Mm -hmm. I ain't no problem. You got the problem. But I realized that, okay, this individual has the right to express themselves. You know, they're my child. They're not the person at work that I can say. If she want to be like that, that's fine. Let people be what they want to be. But I was having a hard time letting my, my child be what he want to be. The thing you see, sisters, is that this is the uh, attachment. And one of the things that we'll be doing in that workshop on managing attachment in relationships, we'll focus more on this. Let me simply point out a few things to you. When you understand what attachment is, an attachment is this clinging, sometimes blind clinging, mm -hmm. to a situation, circumstance, or an individual with the ambition of keeping them the same forever. And this is impossible. This boy, he's not the little baby anymore. He is growing, he is changing, he has his own power, he has his own destiny. And you want to keep the relationship the same. Not even the relationship will stay the same. That too has to change. And this is very difficult. And it's more difficult for women because women are more attached just by orientation, you see? And so it becomes very difficult. And it is very painful when you're trying to hold on to something and it's trying to break away from you. Now, this is much pain. Because the feeling is that, oh, he don't love me no more. He didn't appreciate what I've done blah, 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 blah. It's really a traumatizing experience. Many mothers have gone through it, and many more mothers will go through it, you see, because this attachment is a problem. And we have to manage our urge to become attached, you see. We have to understand that this, is, this son does not belong to you, you see. He is traveling through your life. You are simply a corridor through which he is passing. Hmm? Love him, yes. You see? Do all that you can for him, yes. But don't try to possess. Don't try to interfere with growth. Don't try to interfere with change. Don't clean. Because this will cause much suffering for you. Because he's going to change. This is inevitable. You see? So we have to begin to understand a lot of the suffering in fact, most of the suffering that we experience on a personal level uh, we, occurs because of this attachment. Please make a note of that. We become very attached. And this attachment is out of ignorance. It's one of the afflictions. One of the 21,000 afflictions that ignorance caused. Because how can you not see with your own eyes that everything in life changed? How can you not see that? It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, what they call an awesome truth. It requires no thinking. If you just got eyes, you will see that that is the case. So this attachment is there. And that attachment, this whole urge, arises out of a deep sense of insecurity uh, and all these other things, you see. We'll have to go into it in a lot of detail. But it's clear to understand, as parents, our function is to help the child find their dharma. We don't even understand parenting. Your job, my job as a parent is to help my child find that gift. You can't help them find that gift if you are shutting them down, controlling them, right? Suppressing them. In fact, if you're trying to put the gift in them, who told you that you're going to put their swababa in them? You don't even know your swababa. How you gonna tell them, okay, here's your swababa for you. Right now, follow this course. This is what I chose. This is, I chose for you your swababa. Nice, you see. So our whole approach has to be very different, you see. Very different. And it's fearful, you know. It's a lot of trauma involved in that, you know. And it's a great task that confront us all as parents and as spouses, as husband and wife. A lot of the conflict in our personal relationship with our spouses, our husband, our wife, also arises out of this attachment. Because you still think that that woman that you married 25 years ago is the same woman, and she's not the same woman no more. You don't even look at her. You don't even see her. In the morning when she gets up and go to work, you don't even know what she wore. You don't know how she looked. You don't even look at her face anymore. You look at the face that you have embedded and imprinted in your mind 
from 25 years ago. The woman has gained 50 more pounds since then. <laughs> you see, you still see the slim. The point I'm making is that our image that we're relating to is in our own head. And then we want to keep her the same. Or she wants to keep us the same. And remember, to do that, you have to take a person through this. And let me tell you, the greatest psychological need that we have is for the experience of freedom. And anyone that has the feeling that you shut down their freedom, you're going to have a problem with them. Is that right? Yes. That's right. Whether it's your son, if you take and give him the experience that you have taken his freedom from, you're going to have a problem. Rebellion. If you take the freedom from your wife or the freedom from your husband, they're gone. You see? So, this has to be understood, you see. But something, and you, it's good, Tony, that you had the presence of mind to acknowledge instantaneously that, that that's right, something wrong with me, without losing your self-respect. Now, I don't know if they can appreciate it, but that's, a, that's quite an accomplishment. You didn't lose your sense of worth, you, right? You just understand, oh, this is one of my imperfections, one of my flaws, one of my shortcomings that is, that is not confronted. I got to get to work on myself. You see? So it's not a reflection of you. You didn't take it personal. It doesn't reduce your work. It's, a, it's, a, it's something you got to work on. In the meantime, you're all right. And as long as you can maintain your self-respect, remember what we went through in the class, you have got to hold on to that thing called self-respect and don't lose it. As long as you can hang on to your sense of self-respect, you will handle this situation Very good. And how would you know that it's being handled right? You see, you'll see the other person calming down, conflict de-escalating. You know what I mean? But the boy is going to strive to move toward his freedom. And if you take it from him, you will destroy whatever human in him. Take away this freedom, hmm? and what you have left is a shell. It's ugly. Women <coughs> who have domesticated these men, <coughs> who have taken that thing out of them. They have a man that they can't even respect. No woman respects a man that she can control. Please make a move. You don't even want him. He's no longer a man. Right? So a, a certain amount of freedom, you see, has to be there. So it's very profound. So when we go through these workshops where we're going to deal with managing attachment in our human relationships, you remind them, uh, me to make sure that uh, we talk a lot about uh, this whole dynamic that is going on. And this is real world. And that's what I enjoy about this. This is not philosophy. It's real. And everyone in here, in the room, has got to be able to do this. Here. You see, whether you believe in Allah or don't believe in Allah, that's not the issue. The issue, you're in a relationship, and you better get this stuff right, or you're going to be even more miserable than you are. Fact. Yes, sir. You know, just reflecting on you, Tony, uh, you know, it stirs a lot in me. Anytime you mention these kids, it stirs. <laughs> 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 but we need not go outside of our domains of, in terms of life. All the lessons is right there in your family. Yes, yes, yes. You need not look for lessons outside on your job or somewhere else in other people. You. Your lesson is right there in your family. You know, kids are the greatest teachers of patience. Oh. Yes. That's absolutely right. <laughs> that's absolutely right. <laughs> Why are they here? <laughs> yes. To teach you patience. Because you've been thinking you had patience. You've been telling everybody out of the construction of your ego mythology, your self esteem you know I'm a very patient person, I'm very tolerant, I'm loving. Now they give you some kids. Yeah. And now you see, are you tolerant? <laughs> and you see, no. Are you patient? No. Are you fair? No. None of that. And, and they challenge you in such a way that there's no way to deny it. But there's been even those of us who tried to deny it. And what happened is that when we get these children, or you get a wife, or you get a husband, the first thing you learn is that you don't know nothing about how to interact with a person. <laughs> That's the first realization. You really don't know nothing about life. 
for the first time, the immensity of your ignorance descends on you. And the experience of your ignorance is in the form of just suffering. You can't get along with the woman, or you can't get along with the man, and you're just miserable. Because you don't know nothing. Yes, you read a lot of books. Yes. You got a lot of information about how to be in a relationship. But it's about. It's not even yours. You've not reflected, you've not <laughs> contemplated, you've not eaten this stuff and made it a part of your being. You're just collecting information. And information don't transform nobody. And now life throws you in a real situation where you have to have that. You write that throughout. And we discover these things. Now, sometimes when we get these children, we discover for the first time that I don't have a clue or skill in parenting. These children become a threat. So I got to shut them down. You get in that room, you lock the door, and you time to a chair. Because if they move, they're going to remind you of how little you know. Yeah. And you don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with this kid. There are parents who are locking them kids down physically, mm -hmm. or they lock them down psychologically. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me nothing. You know what I mean? Because you don't want your ignorance to be, you know, revealed. Because you don't know anything, right? And so we shut them down in some shape, form, or fashion. So set the rust. Absolutely right. In fact, you were placed in the context of your family. This family that you are in and the children you have is custom made for you. Please understand this. I mean, custom made. God has made these situations. He has customized them for you. And not only, etc., are there mm -hmm. opportunities, you see, to develop these things, but they also are opportunities to find your dharma. Now, this is interesting, because you all been looking for your dharma outside of your family. And I'm telling you, you will find your dharma looking inside your family. It is there. You just don't know how to look. You've not done the work. You've not done the exercises. You've not done the contemplation. You, don't, you have your eyes closed. You want this done for you. Buddha says, Apadipo Bhava. Become a light unto yourself. You see, you're going to have to do this work. You haven't been initiated. You haven't set anything in the motion. You can't see. It's right there. It's coming. Custom made. It's a tremendous thing. All your so called spiritual attainment. Now you see, you, you've not achieved anything spiritual. Yeah, you can quote Buddha. Yeah, you can quote Jesus. Yeah, you can quote the literature. You know all the philosophy. You can talk about all these profound metaphysical concepts and regions and uh, all this stuff. But you've done not one single ounce of practice. You have no skills at living spiritually. Everything you touch that requires spiritual development, you fail and you have failed miserably. You can maintain no loving relationships with nobody on the planet. You have not even become a good human being, let alone a mystic. Let's be very clear about this thing. We're not, you know, let's not play games with this thing. You see? The first task is becoming a good human being. Forget all about this mystical stuff. First, you become a good human being. Yes, Lieutenant Arshin. I was going to say also as a follow-up to what Tony was saying is that I think the parents need to understand karma too. Yes. I just noticed uh, in my line of work that uh, the parents' greatest fear is that something is going to happen to these kids. Mm. And even if something should happen to them, they got to understand that that's part of his destiny. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? They yeah. figure like, the kids say, I want to go to the show, I'm 16 years old. Well, I don't want them to go to Hillside. He can get shot in the drive-by shooting them. Mm -hmm. Some game bangers may do something to them. And actually, they are retarding the kids' progress simply because they don't want them to get killed. Yes. But uh, I think the parents really need to understand the laws of karma. Yes. Because you can't hold them back. I mean, there's a chance he may get killed. There's a chance that he may not get killed. Yes. And the thing that we always suggest is that you uh, pay his insurance up. Mm -hmm. When we get the calls. <laughs> there's nothing you can really do other than that. You know, I mean... It could be 20 kids in a group, and uh, maybe your kid, uh, they get that bullet. And as you know, with my own personal experience, with you know, my little one drowning and another little kid, is that I shine that light in the window, been shining them for years. And that particular night, they shined it in my, my window. 
and 30,000 kids drown every year. Just so happened, mine and this other little one, uh, they drown. And I think that's what parents got to understand, is that you can't hold his progress up because you're scared he's going to get killed or get hurt. Yeah. All this is laid out before he even got here on the planet. Absolutely. And we got to understand that. And you got to accept that. And you got to, and you got to get all right with that. Because karma, karma is real. See, the thing is that we sit here in these workshops and we talk about this stuff like it's just philosophy. This ain't no philosophy class. This is real. You got karma. You got consequences. And your children do too. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. But Bob Juan, we're here mm. and we're, we're, we're scratching the surface. How many millions of people out there don't have a clue? You know, that, that is the process. That's why we were saying that that makes your birth precious, don't it? it because you have come in contact with the knowledge. You have come in contact with the teaching. It is precious. You have that opportunity to give yourself that kind of relief from all that anxiety that you will have as a parent about your child because you have understood the teachings, even of just karma. Because if you've understood it, you should have some, you should get some relief. It doesn't mean that we wreck, because you don't know either, right? So you don't throw them out into situations, but you understand that I can control their outcome and let that alone. You can't control. If you don't, we become very controlling. Most parents are very controlling. And they're controlling because we don't want anything negative to happen to our children. No, nope, none of us do. You see? None of us do. But reality, unfortunately, does not follow your desires. It follows the karma of the individual. And if it was Jessica time to drown, Jessica has to drown. Whether you want it to, or Janet or not, it doesn't matter. This is in this girl karma. This is what has to go down. And you got to accept. Yes. And that's why I told you earlier this year, you know, my new hero is uh, Joseph Cardinal Bernardino. Bernardino. That's my new hero. When he said he's at peace with himself, when they confirmed that he had an operable cancer, and that's what I look at. Here's a man that has spent over 30 years counseling people for terminal illnesses, mm. families that have undergone tragedies. And I just looked at him and I related to what he said. I mean, I've been on that other side. It was just my turn. Yeah. I understood the laws of commerce. Nothing, I mean, as tragic as it may be. But when you look at it in terms of the laws of karma, it all made sense. And I was like the cardinal, at peace with myself. There's nothing else that I could do. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we don't <laughs> miss the person. It doesn't mean that it devalues their life. No, none of that changed. Yes, your children, your loved ones are precious. No mistake about that. But you accept. I know as a therapist, one of the most difficult things to overcome in the grieving process is the anger. The anger that something has happened that shouldn't have happened. No. Adamo Sanantano. That's how life is. There is death. There is birth, there is growth, there is decay, and then there is death. That is reality. And it will happen to everyone. You see, our children, our spouses, and death in many forms, not even physical. A time will come when your spouse just may leave you. Now you're going to have to get right for that. It may not even be death. They may divorce you. you or you may divorce them. It's going to be separation. And you have to get all right with this thing. You see? And you have to begin to understand this thing. And the karma is so important. If you really want to do something for your children, then teach them how to create good karma. Do you understand this here? Yeah. Do you understand this here? If you're really concerned yeah. about the outcome, show them how to create them good karma. If you are showing them how to do number create bad karma, then you're right. You're going to be on the edge every Saturday night because that's all you have taught them. It's how to create bad karma. Because that's all you know. You yourself don't even know what good karma is. You don't even know how to create good karma. It's amazing. You don't even know how to create good karma. When I'm telling you that every act that you do has a consequence, this is what we call karma, but you don't know how to create good karma. That is what the, the, the concept of savior is about. Savor is the conscious and deliberate creation of good karma. Karma good enough for you to make spiritual progress. 
how and seva is always done as a contribution to other human beings. You can do seva on a mundane physical level. You can do seva with your body. You can do seva with your wealth. You can do seva with your knowledge. You know, so many different levels. You can do seva from every dimension and point of your being. But you got to do some seva. And you can look at people who've done no seva. They have those useless kind of lives, and their lives are just full of misery. Because they've been useless. They've been of no use to nobody. They've done no seva. They don't even do seva for their family. Nothing. They're in that strictly me and my mindset. And look at them, and their life is just one continuous cycle of misery. Because all they're creating is negative karma for themselves. They're not putting out anything. They're not getting anything back. It's as simple as that. They want to be loved, but they don't want to love nobody. You, they want, some love me, love me, love me, love me, do this for me, 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 me. But they themselves don't want to do nothing for nobody. And then they can't wonder why don't nobody love you because you ain't love nobody. Simple. Karma. You understand? This is clear. Useless. Just useless. Seva is a conscious, deliberate effort to transcend this state of uselessness. And it doesn't mean that we have to contribute a billion dollars. No. You contribute out of whatever you actually possess in terms of your humanity. You see? The thing is that you got to give. You see? Because that creates to come. That creates to come out of which you cannot do. And if you are able to do that, then teach your children how to create good karma for themselves, how to find their dharma. Look at this. What are you teaching your children? How to get a good job. What is this? All your parenting training is focused around how to turn them into an employee. What's wrong with you? You're going to reduce a human being to an employee, to a widget? What's wrong with you? You teach them nothing about how to create common. You teach them nothing about Dharma. You teach them how to become a widget in a factory. And you have the audacity to call yourself a parent. You have the nerve to say you love this child. What kind of love is that that will reduce a human being to a widget? It's deep. It's deep. It's deep. It's deep. It's deep. It should be the case that I don't care whether my child gets a job, don't get a job, until you find your dharma. You stay with me, I'll feed you, I'll clothe you, I'll keep you in this house till you're 60 years old if you haven't found your dharma. And my thing is find your dharma. I got your back. You get dharma. Ain't throwing you out of no house. You get your dharma. You see, and you stay here with daddy too. So, right. You understand? Look at the difference. You can look at the difference in the quality of the human being you will produce. They say that you can measure, one of our measurement of our contribution is in the form of your children. Are you turning out useless children? Just useless. Because you put nothing in. You yourself are so useless, duplicating uselessness. Is there any wonder that the world is in this shape? It's a very different thing. So uh, um, we have to understand that the immense role that Seva, we have to do some Seva. If you want to live a spiritual life, you're going to have to do some Seva. There's just no way around that. You see, you're a long way away from dhyana and meditation sitting in these exotic yoga postures and refusing mantras and going inside. You're a long, long, long way away. And even if you should by accident get a mantra, you'll make no spiritual progress whatsoever, I guarantee you. Because you make no foundation for the growth of that sin. Life imitates 
imitates nature. When the bird is so old, the mother pushes it from the nest. They push them out of the net because this bird, the mother, nor the bird child will ever attain enlightenment. It does not matter. We're human beings. Mm -hmm. And in, in this state of a human being is the only state in which there's the opportunity to mm -hmm. do drama. Right? But there's not the opportunity to do drama, then that's fine. You know, when your kids get a certain age, 16, throw their ass out. Because they can't do no drama. It's all right. But you, these human beings, these are not birds, chicks. I've already told you that every being and every other form beneath this have no possibility of achieving enlightenment. It is only in this form that we can create the luxury, the time, the situation, the circumstance by which this being now can step into God realization. Hence, our way is, has to be different, you see? Now, yes, that is my own personal feeling. Whether the child is at my house or not, that sense of supportiveness must be there. You see, there's no, you don't never stop being no parent. It is interesting, one of the uh, program, cable program that I did was, happened to be done with a gentleman named uh, Satoli, Baba Satoli. I don't know if any of you know him, but Baba Satoli was uh, one of N Nelson Mandela's uh, sympathizer and organizer here in Chicago. And, um, and uh, was very much a part of the politics of South Africa. And Baba Satoli and I did a program on cable on African family systems. And in that program, I don't know, Bilal is, it may be back there somewhere yeah, if you're curious. Yes, Dr. Peace. Yes, Dr. Mm -hmm. Peace. Yeah. But one of the things you remember, June, that was pointed out was the story Baba Satoli told about his coming to America to complete his PhD. And he was married, had a couple of children, but he had to go and get his mother permission mm -hmm. to bring his family here. And to us, he said, you know that strikes us as odd because we would say, man, you 35 years old, okay. them your kids, yes. your mama can't <laughs> tell you what to do. And Baba Satoli was trying to make the Western audience understand that, look, it's very different because in Africa and in, in the original relationship of a child to a parent, there is no such thing as you ever stop being a child to your parent. That never happens. And Baba Sotoli went on to tell the stories that his mother said no. He couldn't bring his kids. He had to go and appeal to his grandfather, you see what I mean, to lobby on his behalf and, and wear the old woman down. And finally she consented. You know what I mean? But And they asked her, Baba, if she hadn't consented, would you prepare to leave? They said, I was totally prepared to leave. I have no say so in the matter. That's my mother. You see? So this kind of commitment to su be supported to our children is not over at legal age. It's a Western concept. Right? And yes, my belief is that if I fail to support my children in the fighting of their Dhamma and their Swababa, I have failed. Technically, I don't care if they got a PhD and making a hundred thousand dollars a year. I have failed and I have failed miserably. I missed the opportunity to be a parent. Do you know how great it is to be a parent? Let me tell you, a parent is just a little bit, they're almost the same as a guru. In fact, your first guru is your mother. Is your mother. Mothers, please be aware of that. Whether you want to be a guru or not, you're a guru to your kids. Now give them some decent teachings. Mm. These are your disciples. Mm. Yes, please? My, my point is that uh, parenting does involve skill. And one thing as a parent you have to be uh, careful about is uh, enabling your children to be useless or remain useless. Mm. It's one thing to help them find their dharma or their goals yes. in life and to help them achieve what they've set out to achieve. But another thing is that you should not uh, hold them, overprotect them to the point that uh, they become overly dependent. That's yes. what I mean. Of course. We talked about these negative states of parenting, overindulgent, mm -hmm. overprotective, yeah. overambitious, overcritical. For those of you who weren't in the classes, then you, this may be news to you, but there are dysfunctional styles of parenting that produces dysfunctional children. I mean, it's simple. But you're right, Emma, we're not talking about parenting them 
on the useless side. Right. In fact, if they're becoming more useless, you know you're not helping them find their dharma or their swap But I mean, that's, if your children are useless, you know that you done messed up, yeah. right? So it's not a question. Helping your child find their dharma and their swap baba never will contribute to their uselessness. Quite the reverse. Quite the reverse. So we need not have those fears. If any fear we should have is that if you do fail to cr help them find their swap baba, then you will have really, in a sense, raised a useless child. They will definitely be useless. They'll not only be useless to you, they'll be useless to the world. And you will simply send them out there to marry into a, get them out of family, right? And they'll marry some useless man or some useless woman, and they'll produce little useless children. They become genetic. They become genetic. So, we have to really do those things. So, uh, <laughs> in closing, uh, because the hour is going on, I know that there's, Dorothy has an announcement you want to make about something, and I know Bilal want to mention something, but I want to encourage you that, uh, to, to contemplate Seba now. The conscious, deliberate effort to create the requisite quality of karma that you will need to make spiritual progress. You see? Uh, to really give some deep, deep reflection to that. Well, I talked about the negative comments that you're clearly to avoid. The alcohol, the drugs, you know, and all these other things. But now I want you to really reflect and, and, and put some good stuff out in the universe for yourself. Put some love out there. Put some kindness out there. You'll be surprised. I know this sounds uh, perhaps strange to you. You know, uh, because you've been trying to think so-called practically, but I'm telling you, put some love out there and see what happens to your life. Your life is nothing but the consequences of your previous action. Please understand that if you've understood nothing else. Whatever you are experiencing today is a direct consequence of what you did yesterday. Right? And your tomorrow is not going to change unless you change your today. It's not going to change. If you're miserable in your life, you don't have... Nobody in your life who loves you or somebody for you to love. If you have nobody in your life that care about you, know well that you have not created any karma to attract anybody of that quality in your life. Stop playing victim. You have been useless. <laughs> and that's what you got is a useless existence. And that's just a fact. But the beauty is that you can change that. You do some saver. Create the kind of life you want through Sabre. Now you have some things to say, you can come here.